we're, as I said, we're going to be talking about my work with Luxonic. So let's start with some definitions, first of all. Come in, have a seat. Um, so when we talk about immersive technologies, we talk about leveraging technologies that create the perception of being physically present in a digital world. Okay, and so that can mean actually several different things. So we can talk about the spectrum of what XR, MR, AR, VR, there's all these uh, acronyms out there. So let's talk about what that means. So the first one we're going to talk about and that you'll experience today is virtual reality. So that is simply creating a totally fully digital world in which you are interacting with the digital world and you've stepped outside of the physical world. Um, when we talk about XR, that's a kind of a blanket term, so XR means extended reality, that encompasses augmented reality and mixed reality. There is a fine distinction between the two. For the purposes of most conversations, they're used interchangeably. But augmented reality means um, having a digital overlay on your physical world, and mixed reality means being able to interact with that. Um, so there you go, just what, exactly as we said. Um, and we'll look at applications of that in a couple of slides. Okay, and then we talk, when we talk about 360 video, that's simply taking a video and making it um, fully interactive. So if you look up in your, not interactive, fully, um, well, we'll make it 3D essentially. So if you're wearing a headset and you look up, you can see your, the ceiling of your 3D world. If you look down, you can see the floor. Um, you're gonna see that on some of the videos we brought today. Okay, so how does that play into medical education over the past half decade? So it's becoming, um, Increasingly at the forefront, it's the subject of papers, studies, pilots, grand rounds. So here in 2019, uh, University of Manitoba at the Department of Pediatrics featured augmented reality and virtual reality in medical education as part of um, their uh, grand rounds. Um, there's partners, partnerships between major universities, institutions, and commercial partners. So Microsoft famously partnered using HoloLens with uh, Case Western Reserve. Uh, university to uh, introduce some radio, radiology um, software um, and for studying anatomy as well. So, and we'll talk about why there's a difference, why there's a benefit in a few slides. Okay, um, and this is happening the world over. Here's a surgeon from the UK who's talking about the power of um, mixed reality for teaching, uh, again, for anatomy and for surgery students um, over at the NHS, the National Health Services. Um, and here's yet another study talking about uh, how HoloLens was used to improve memory recall in anatomy, physiology, so things that required um, visual learning and 3D applications and understanding. And what happened? So, uh, question? Uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with HoloLens. Is this a VR used in the medical field, or is it like HoloLens VR? has been discontinued. It was a headset by uh, Microsoft that was actually more mixed reality based. So there was augmented reality overlays. And in fact, this is a video that kind of showcases that um, augmented reality, mixed reality overlay. So you can so see is that more of an AR. X. Yeah, I would say XR. AR XR. XR. So XR is extended reality, and that just kind of means the blanket term of augmented reality and mixed reality. Okay. And then augmented reality is simply seeing you know, an overlay. Like for example, there's a digital sign in my headset that pointed at this and said this is a computer. And then mixed reality would be if I could click on that and then mm -hmm. say, let me control my computer. Oh, it's similar to what they're doing with the Vision Pro right now then? Yes, oh. yeah, yeah, there is a lot of hopes for that. Um, I did include any slides on that actually, but um, you, I brought a MetaQuest Pro today that will allow you to um, experience mixed reality. Okay, so here's an example of the HoloLens. Oh, that's very loud. The HoloLens is absolutely the most amazing piece of technology. Within five seconds, I realized that the world had changed. It was immediate realization that this is something exciting and we have to be a part of this. Seeing things in 3D is something that you could do before with some glasses. The thing that the HoloLens gives you is the ability to walk around those 3D objects and to really experience them as if they're in the room with you. What is augmented reality? It is mixed reality. And what that means is I still see you, I still see this room and everything around me, but the digital content is inserted into the room as if it's actually there. As a teacher, I can see what they're all looking at. 
And that's something that we think has real power. It's actually opening up our interactions with each other. The biggest drive is getting the anatomy curriculum completely done by the time we move into the new health education campus. Today, we at the Cleveland Clinic are constructing a state of the future health education campus. Our students will learn using the most forward-looking educational programs. HoloLens is a key part of this. The actual act of dissection hasn't changed in generations. We have to be much, much more effective and efficient. The biggest thing about medical school is there's just so much information and so much knowledge that you're being asked to learn. HoloLens is going to enable us to teach in an integrated way and to look at the body in ways they haven't been able to see it. It's sort of having x-ray vision, seeing through the skin. So we don't have to watch the entire thing. Kind of well, well, but the point here is to show you how mixed reality works and how you can interact with it, specifically in medicine. Um, and we'll show you um, more of that hands-on later. So why immersive? So there are studies out there that talk about um, greater learner retention, cost savings, better emotional connection to um, the learning content. Um, there is uh, more focus compared to, and this is all compared to traditional e-learning, so compared to digital um, slides, compared to online learning um, and classroom learning, and four times faster training. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, other added advantages, okay? But basically, uh, it's safe, it's repeatable, it's standardized. So imagine, rather, um, who are the medical students in the room? Any of you? Medical I'm students? Fellow. Fellow. You're a fellow? Okay. Fellow. Well, welcome. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Sri Devi. Sri Devi. Okay, welcome. And what are you a fellow in? Renal pathology. Oh, perfect. Oh, you work with Dr. Solis. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> um, so uh, you may have remembered during your medical training that back when you and I and Dr. Solis were training, that the first time we probably had to do something was on an actual patient. The first time we sutured, mm -hmm. the first time we did an art line insertion, um, and you're not going to be perfect the first time you uh, do a procedure. So that means multiple folks for your patients, it can be uncomfortable. So here you're learning that muscle memory and retiring that risk. That's what we mean by safe, repeatable, and standardized. Um, we talked about the improved knowledge retention and learning outcomes. And then, of course, cost savings. So if you don't have to have a cadaver, um, a suture pad, uh, you know, pig's feet, uh, or actually bring in a uh, learner into the OR every single time you need to learn a procedure, that's where the cost savings comes from. Okay, so we're going to go into some case studies of what we're doing at Luxonic. Um, so we're going to talk about, um, you're actually going to experience MedCast 360. Um, so this is our suite of 360 learning videos, and basically, um, we use this for familiarization, orientation, when it helps to have ex exposure to a 360 environment before actually being there. Um, so in, we partnered with Sask Poly, which, is, uh, which has a nursing school down in Saskatchewan, to talk about uh, how or to make videos around how nurses would be oriented to the OR environment. So uh, in this particular video, um, the circulating nurse is oriented, you're viewing this whole video in 360 from the viewpoint of your circulating nurse. Um, and when you slip on the headset, you're in this environment, you hear the beats of the OR, you're watching them perform this laparoscopic gallbladder removal from that viewpoint. You look up, there's the OR lights, you look down, there's the OR floor. Um, so it helps you know what your position is in the, re in the real world in relation to where your um, interdisciplinary um, team is. Uh, and helps you familiarize. Okay, so we talked about the case surgical case study observation. Um, we've used it for ultrasound training as well, where um, with telerobotic ultrasound training, uh, we used it to supplement in-person training um, and use it to uh, train and orientate um, ultrasound technicians to their new environment. And one of my favorite studies um, was for pediatric MRI preparation. So who here's ever been in an MRI machine? Anyone? Yes, I had. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's closed. It's confined. If you're claustrophobic, it's a lot. And if you're not claustrophobic, it's just a different experience. So with the pediatric population, kids aren't necessarily going to be calm or you know uh, at ease the first time they're in this environment. So what we did with the study is we orientated the children, patients to the environment in the 360 world before introducing them to the MR. And in all of the cases except one, we were able to negate the need for sedation. Because when children are nervous, they're anxious, 
uh, they're going to move around, which ruins your MRI study. So that's huge, not being able, not being uh, needing to medicate um, the patients for this procedure. Okay. The next thing you'll experience today is our radiology workflow in um, virtual reality. So now we're jumping from 360 video to virtual reality. So remember, that's a fully digital world in which you interact. So when you're a radiologist and you need to read your images, you have uh, your high resolution monitors, you have your dictation software, you have your markup tools. And that takes up physical square footage, it takes up infrastructure. Um, so we've recreated that entire workflow in the virtual reality world, and you'll be able to see that. I'll download some x-rays for you to be able to um, uh, play around with, and then um, you can actually replicate that entire workflow. So theoretically, you could be sitting on the beach in um, Hawaii and be reading your images um, and still uh, have, you know, be doing your job as a radiologist. So when you look at it, you will be seeing this kind of room here, and basically you'll have all of your tools for markup. Uh, and we also have a collaborative capability. We won't be test showing that today. But with the collaborative capability, if I am you know, uh, an emergency physician in Northern Alberta, and I'm trying to decipher an x-ray and say, you know, does this fracture, do we need to reduce it, do we need to align it more or not, I can review it with a remote collaborator like an orthopedic surgeon who says, you know, I think it's too um, angulated, you should reduce that more. So there's also um, remote teleconsultation capabilities as well. Okay, so um, where, where are we at with this imaging platform? Um, you'll see Siever grinding all over it, that's what we used to call this. Now it's, um, we just call it the Sonic Imaging Platform. So it's commercially available for education as well as for diagnostics. We have Health Canada Class 2 device approval. We're per, uh, pursuing FDA approval at present. Um, we've done educational trials showing um, non-inferiority to the gold standard, which is, of course, reading their own x-rays and ultrasounds and the like. Um, undergoing clinical rollout in Canada and the States, and we have some uh, overseas partners as well. And very coolly, we've done some space training with this as well. Um, we've already talked about what this is, and I'm not going to play the video. Maybe I am. Yeah, we'll just quickly go over the first few seconds of this, or the first minute of this video, just to kind of show you what the collaboration looks like. time on this in person. Um, so coming back to austere environments and space-like environments, I talked about this in my space medicine lecture um, about the value of planning something that is low mass, low weight, low power, easy to use. So um, when we talk about x-ray imaging in space, there is no x-ray imaging in space because you can't bring those high resolution monitors with you. Um, so on one of my underwater missions, we said, well, this is a space-like environment. It's remote, it's real. It's, uh, or it's remote and resource limited. So I, we loaded up the uh, trauma imaging of a simulated patient. They shattered their shoulder blade, and we loaded it up into that Siebert suite that you saw. And then we actually got the head of radiology in Saskatoon, 4,600 kilometers away, to join me in that radio, um, radiology room, and we were able to um, review that imaging together. So now imagine there's a trauma on the space station and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how injured is this astronaut as the crew medical officer? Uh, I might not be able to interpret the image myself, so then I can hop on to the flight surgeon's admission control and get some at ground expert advice. Um, and then, throw back to the space medicine lecture, remember, the further you go, the more distance you have to contend with, the more time delay you have. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about a round trip mission with the moon, that could be a 2.4 second delay round trip, which, you know, you can still hold a conversation with. You know, if you're looking for a diagnosis, if that comes back to you two seconds later, not a problem. Uh, if you're on Mars and you need to figure out if, you know, how to treat a fracture, if there is a uh, collapsed lung that you need to um, do a need, uh, needle decompression on, you probably, uh, well, either, first of all, there's no synchronicity. So you need to be able to interpret that in real time, or if it's non-emergent, 
there's asynchronous collaboration that you can um, perform, so you can just wait for those images to be sent to Earth, reviewed, and come back to you, which is pretty much how we practice these days anyways in the emergency room. Um, so if I'm up working in rural, somewhere in rural Alberta, I'm interpreting my own images and then making my best judgment call and then best case scenario minutes later, that happens about 10% of the time, more often days later because I'm working on the weekend is when the imaging report comes in. So this would be pushing the boundaries, creating a new standard for collaboration. So we did um, test our VR uh, in the 360 environment. So here's my teammate Heidi. Um, we're testing our Sievert Suite in 360 video. So she, oh, that did not play. There we go. Here is Heidi on video. Look at me and Liam. Amazing. So just a very, uh, very short video there. Okay. So the second, third platform that we're going to show you today is um, our caregiver platform. And basically, um, we talked about virtual reality, we talked about retired risk, we talked about practicing skills. So you are all going to be paramedics saving airways today. Uh, Hannah, you've been through this before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Zayat, you've been through it before. Okay, perfect. Um, so we have worked with um, multiple groups. We've worked with airway uh, or paramedics, uh, medical laboratory technicians, search and rescue to create VR training um, and simulation modules. Um, we worked with anesthesiologists, so um, so those are some of our case studies. Uh, so in the paramedic assessment, it's everything as simply as doing a scene survey, performing a head tilt uh, jaw thrust to open up the airway, to doing the more advanced stuff like intubation. Um, it is a longer module, it's at least 15 to 20 minutes to complete from start to finish, so more likely what's going to happen is you'll kind of just get a glimpse of it, play around, do a step, and then move on to the next headset, so you won't get to experience the whole thing because um, there's a little more time for that today, unfortunately. Okay, here's a snapshot from our medical lab assessment. So when we're training um, medical laboratory technicians, um, is from start to finish, you're being orientated to the lab environment, you're sanitizing your hands, donning your PPE, and very cool, you can actually pipette up samples. So here they're performing your analysis. Um, analysis. And then my favorite part is when you pipe that down onto the slide, you can actually look through the microscope and make your judgment for field counts for um, bacteria, white cells, um, red blood cells. Um, and then my particular favorite, for deep space missions, we have worked with the Canadian Space Agency. Um, they had several modules looking for emerging technologies that can help astronauts on long duration missions. So we have created a whole sepsis module for them. Um, I think this might be that video if it will play. Maybe not. There are a lot of videos here. Um, I'll quickly show you a snapshot of the airway video. Okay. So when you get into the module, you'll see something similar, just an updated version of this. So like I said, you'll performing everything from elementary stuff to opening up an airway to putting in uh, nasal pharyngeal tubes, uh, making sure you have the right size, uh, going through the steps of what you need to do, and then the more advanced stuff like suctioning, uh, putting in endotracheal tube. So when someone asks you how your day goes today, you can just tell them you to be a patient. space is trying to kill you. Okay, so how can we mitigate some of those risks? Remember we talked about NASA's Human Research Roadmap and Exploration Medical Capability uh, and their entire interactive list of risks to human health. So one of those, as you may remember, is risk of skills deterioration and risk of inadequate human uh, computer interaction. So performance uh, 
errors due to training deficiencies. So we talked about also going back to the packing challenges for space, um, the need to be compact, low mass, low volume, easy to use, um, and hardy and intuitive low astronaut time to use as well. And then we talked about having ideally the ability to upload knowledge directly to our brains. So here's how AR VR answers that um, and how it's being used in spaceflight. So NASA has used it on their underwater missions uh, at the Aquarius Reef Base. They've used HoloLens for um, medical teleconsultation. Um, they've used it on their underwater simulated uh, EVAs, extravehicular activities. Um, and they've also used it on the space station. There's a really cool article out there. I don't think I included it. It's called Nine Ways We Use AR VR for Space. Um, but HoloLens has famously made it to um, the ISS and it's been used for just-in-time training for operations, not medical necessarily. Um, they've had a holoportation where a couple missions ago, maybe two years ago, they had a flight surgeon holoport themselves into the ISS and be able to provide instruction. Um, so they're importing that digital image into a physical space. Um, and then the, I've also had 360 cameras up there to bring back high resolution 360 video so the ISS interior is accessible um, to, to just everyone on the ground. And then uh, there's also training modules so that we also use AR, VR for training on spacewalks or EVAs. Um, so here's a snapshot from one of the, the sepsis module that we made for the Canadian Space Agency. So when you walk into this um, uh, scenario, you are a start on a spacewalk and let's see this one play. Warning. 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 Suit breach detected. EVA one. EVA one, this is EVA two. Come in. Approach waypoint. Acknowledged. EVA one, this is EVA two. Come in. Retrieve patch kit. Stay with me, buddy. Looks like you have a suit breach. I'm on it. Secure patch. Return to base. Oh, that was close, bud. Let's get you back to base to get you checked out. So once you get back into base, it's where your interactivity and your um, ability to assess the patient comes in. Oh good, you're up. That was a close one. How do you feel? You had a suit breach, but we got you patched up in time. I'm just going to give you a once over from head to toe now to make sure you're okay. So again, we're not going to watch the entire thing, but what you'll appreciate here is the interactivity. Like we're going to start by putting some monitors on you, monitors, make sure that your OG sets are covered. You can actually we got down to 85% up there. I'm going to skip ahead to Setting the Setting at 95%, there, not bad. That's one of my favorite parts. So when you actually got pretty lucky this time. time. Tympanic membrane is intact, like no signs of perforation. Exam. So again, we don't need to watch the entire thing. The other part about I like the I like about this is it was my one opportunity to be a lunar astronaut. So. <laughs> Was this loaded in PowerPoint? Or no, just as it right from like your link. Okay, I'm going to figure out how to get back to where I was. Oh, yeah, right here. slideshow. Okay. So we'll wrap up in the next 10 minutes here and then we'll get you guys into, um, into the hands-on. Okay, so um, here's another application of how we use AR VR 360 video to um, prepare for space. So um, this is, you, as I talk, talk to you about in um, the space medicine um, lecture, we use analog environments to prepare ourselves for the space environment. So one of the things we do at the International Astro Institute for Astronautical Sciences is we have a gravity offset harness at the Florida, at Florida Tech. And so basically we're able to upload, uh, offload a certain amount of our weight. Uh, in the last lecture I showed you how we offloaded 99% of our weight to simulate fixing panels outside of the ISS and weightlessness. So what we have here is we have a simulated uh, lunar yard that 
replicates the lunar landscape, and we've actually uh, simulated one sixth gravity. And then um, we have here I am in an EVA suit, and we just wanted to see, like, as a proof of concept, can we use uh, 360 video as well as virtual reality uh, in this environment uh, for additional training? So I have to say, wearing a headset in a one sixth gravity is one of the most surreal experiences you, you could ever have. So if you can imagine, you're in a suit and then you're immersed in either pass-through or in a VR world um, in one six gravity, it adds to the realism of your training. And then if you're doing pass-through reality, mixed reality, in a lunar simulated EVA, you can add instruction for a moonwalk, for example. Okay, so um, summary. We have done work for the Canadian Space Agency. We've talked about the projects we have with regulatory bodies, paramedics, um, lab tech search and rescue, and we've talked about some of the testing that we're doing in high fidelity environments, uh, parabolic flight, and space like environments. Um, okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk to you about today that you'll get to try is point of care ultrasound. So we have leveraged mixed reality point of care ultrasound um, to create a um, system that is portable and that has um, uh, an advantage in ergonomics compared to tra traditional handheld ultrasound and emergency department ultrasound. Um, so this was developed for the Canadian Space Agency's Impact Canada Deep Space Health Challenge. Um, we made it to the finals. We were one of five finalists um, to develop this. And again, plans to test in progressively higher fidelity environments. So I think that's kind of the running theme here. Um, so brought it up to the Arctic Circle and we tested it uh, there. Um, tested it on an underwater mission, brought it to my space medicine students, and we casted it to the screen. So what's actually really cool here is my student here is seeing her screen in front of her, but the rest of us, myself as the instructor in the class, can see what she's seeing there so I can give her further instruction. And then one of the highlights um, that with this technology is, uh, this is on our demo in Montreal with the Canadian Space Agency. There's um, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques, he's also a physician, so and he has background in ultrasound, so we got him to try the device and um, use it and kind of put, give his two cents on rural and remote and space applications. Um, okay, so we're going to return to a question that we asked in the space medicine lecture is, what if we didn't just strive to meet the standard of care uh, in austere environments, but surpass it? Um, and why does that matter? Okay, so coming back to talking about the advantages of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, extended reality. So we talked about retiring risk. We talked about um, building muscle memory. The other part of that, there's unlimited redos. There's kind of that rule in medicine, if you, if you do to attempt twice and you miss, it's time to hand it over to a colleague. That's true of intubations, it's true of IV insertion, that's true um, of arterial lines. Okay, so here you can, you can practice until you have that muscle memory down. You can go to higher stakes scenarios without having to wait to see that in your training. Um, so, in theory, in emergency medicine, you should know how to perform a thoracotomy. You should know how to crack a chest. Uh, I never saw that in my training. Did, did you ever see that in your training? It, it's, it's rare, and it's also terrifying when it happens, right? So, to be able to see those really once in a lifetime, once in a decade scenarios, you can actually bring that into the VR world. Uh, it's faster, you can build in metadata to your 3D objects, so we talked about building um, information into your mixed reality world and getting more information, collaboration, savings, um, and increased knowledge confidence uh, and, and retention. Um, okay, so that's about all I'm going to say on that. So this is a slide from Oculus, this, uh, by the way, just to give credit where credit's due. Okay, so just to end here, let's bring it back to um, applications for Earth. So we talked about space being, we've talked about remote resource limited environments being analogs for space, but maybe we can use some of the technologies we use to succeed in space to do some good on Earth. We talked about nearly half the world's population being rural by recent census data, and we talked about all of us um, having had to endure a, remote, a resource limited environment through the pandemic. We didn't have access to our traditional physical workspaces. We didn't have access to our physical sim labs. Um, so we are also um, adds a lot when the unexpected, like a pandemic happens. Um, so just to end off here, where are we headed with the future of immersive technologies? What about combining other emerging technologies 
to help Lynette's level up with the with immersive. Um, so the other we've talked about these um, other technologies in passing in the uh, engineering tomorrow lecture. So artificial intelligence and big data. What happens when we bring that to medicine and to uh, increase our insights? And specifically, what happens when we bring that to immersive immersive medicine? So AI is also a hot topic uh, in all aspects of clinical medicine and education. Uh, we need to know how it will impact our work, our interpretation, how it will make things better, and also how it will, uh, um, the perils of AI. So talking about the potential, when we, if we can create just-in-time training or real-time augmented reality overlays of our physical world, but we can also bring in machine learning uh, uh, insights to help us with diagnosis, Remember, we talked about the old school method of diagnosing differently. We talked about the pigeon study with the, B, with the BBC article, the pigeons looking at pathology slides um, and diagnosing, right? So it's a different type of intelligence. So how about we bring in AI as a different type of intelligence to help us with diagnosis? Um, so that's, just, that's uh, applicable in rural settings where you are often the only physician in town. So you don't have other brains to help you. It's just you making the diagnosis. It's, it's helpful in space. It's helpful in Mars to help you make more informed decisions. And then the other part of medicine is that um, uh, the rate of guidelines of literature out there is changing so rapidly. It's so hard to keep abreast of um, changing guidelines in clinical practice. So AI, um, as well as augmented reality, can help with that. Um, so that's about all I have, okay? So we talked about the benefits uh, already of immersive. I won't go over that again. Um, but basically, the immersive offers us uh, low resource technologies to help address medical challenges both in space and on Earth. Um, for education, for training, for just-in-time guidance, for diagnostics, and um, you know where are we headed next? Integration with uh, additional emerging technologies, uh, wider scale pilots, deployments, education, training um, in space and remote and rural environments. And that's really all I have. So any questions? No, okay. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, what's your opinion on moving towards remote surgeries? So we could combine the like, headsets with robotic, um, yeah. Like yeah, so remote surgery. Yeah, remote surgery still in my mind isn't a possibility today. It's been um, for a variety of reasons. So it's been studied as early as 2008. Mm -hmm. Like there was a telerobotic simulation between New York City and Toulouse, France, and or maybe Strasbourg, somewhere in France. And um, you know you can do demonstrations, but like even you know a millisecond delay mm -hmm. could be an impact on the difference between um, severing an artery or tying off the artery. And so they did, they have done studies. There was a study between McMaster's, McMaster University, one of the general surgeons there, um, on the NEMO-8 mission, so that was in the late, mid-2000s, um, did some tele-robotic guidance with this robot based in McMaster to help tie a suture knot underwater. Um, in that underwater habitat. But the time delays, if there's anything more than a millisecond delay, it can result in the patient injury hazard or morbidity or mortality. Um, so for the moon or Mars, it needs to be real time and instantaneous. You can have a robotics, robotic surgery, which once AI is increased enough to recognize anatomical variations, recognize critical errors, um, and augment um, a human's training, that's the potential, but Earth guidance for moon and beyond isn't a practical solution. How would you deal, so with remote, any remote practices in those extreme environments underwater in space and you're dealing with a different gravity, so if I'm dealing with it remotely from wherever I am and I don't have access to you know, the harness to replicate that environment that I'm working in, wouldn't that affect if I'm, supposedly, you know, if way in the future where I could, um, where someone could use the VR to use the same acts in yeah. the environment, like through a machine. That's, that's a great question. Would it, it wouldn't move, like you, your movement wouldn't um, be at the same. And so you would need, what I'm yeah, so you're saying that how do you translate putting in surgical maneuvers in 1G to a 1.6G yes, or 1.6 environment? That's a great question, actually. So there are, you know, there are 
models of surgery in zero G right now. So surgical glove boxes, for example, that are purely oh, for okay. me as an operator in zero G to work on. You're kind of ta talking a step beyond that. So the answer to that is we would need to plan for that and we would need to be able to adjust for that conversion, right? It's a currency conversion of sorts, right? So a good example on Earth is um, in Calgary, there's something called the neuro arm. It's a robotic arm that does brain surgery. Uh, and its advantage over a human neurosurgeon is it filters out tremor and it can work at the micrometer scale mm -hmm. rather than the millimeter scale. Mm -hmm. um, and it does that through a series of computer algorithms and adjustments, right? So then you just put in an algorithm that recognizes this is how what the motions are in 1, 1 G, this would be the motion of 1, 6 G, right? So taking away the medical aspect for a second, we were to take a step here mm -hmm. on Earth, this is how we walk. When you get into 1, 6 G in a harness or just on the moon, the first time you take a step, you're going to go bounding, right? So then your brain adjusts to that. You translate how to learn on that. So that would be how you would go about programming that. But that's a very good question. I haven't been asked that before, but it's, there's ways to do it. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. We are at 40 past. Um, take about three minutes. I'm going to set up the um, various stations here, and then we'll get going. On, and then you can try ultrasounding. I'm just going to double check that that's connected to Wi Fi so I can pass. See you guys. Yeah, this is just right, really, because there are three setups and three of you. So. That actually works very well. Okay, yeah. and actually. There's a guest Wi-Fi, correct? There's the UWS, I think? Yeah. Yep. Let me just double check which we're on. 
guest at U of A. Sign into the network. Uh, let's do that. I'm going to go to the browser. So now that we're on Wi-Fi, look how excited it is. Go back to Limify, start that, and okay. All right, so what I'm gonna get you guys to do is, let me see if I can cast this. And I'll show you what we do. Does anyone here have an experience with ultrasound? Once or twice. I did it right down for a portable one. We were playing with it in COVID. <laughs> oh, cool. So, who, sorry, who brought that? My, my dad. Oh, cool. He okay. Just, he just ordered it because for the hospital, he's a, he's a physician. So okay, surgery. okay. So, during COVID, you already gone. You're playing with it during COVID. That's lockdown. awesome. <laughs> So hopefully it'll cast and I can guide you through what you're gonna do. Okay, but the connection doesn't always work. So what I'll do is I'll give you guys a demo first of what, um, let me cut, take up to 30 seconds. Let's see if this is on. Sometimes it shuts off. Um, so even, even if this doesn't cast, basically you guys are going to scan each other's radial arteries, okay, and that's what the um, ultrasound jelly is, so I'll bring that over here. You're going to put some jelly on your wrists. You're going to feel your pulse first so you have an idea of where your radial artery is, so if you need to just do that now, okay, and you can do it on each other, you can do it on yourself, Then you're going to put some jelly on, and then um, you're going to put the probe on, okay, and just make sure it's facing to either your right or your patient's right, depending on who you're scanning. And then you're just gonna look for a little circle that's pulsing. It'll be very obvious, okay? Um, so if this doesn't connect, that's okay, I can still show you. Okay. So it's not gonna connect, but you guys can start playing with this right now. This is good to go. Um, I'll just adjust the depth for you. Okay. So whoever wants to play with this first, you are welcome to. I'm going to bring over the ultrasound jelly and a cloth. So here's the ultrasound jelly. Okay, the hand connectors are very intuitive. You just mm -hmm. use basically this trigger mm -hmm. to um, work on the controls, but you shouldn't need to adjust the controls because everything is set up. Okay. What should I do now? Yeah, just like slip it on over your head. And then if it's, yeah, oh, if you need to adjust the um, helmet, just uh, rotate that dial. So one way tightens and one way opens. I'm going to... What should I do after this? Uh, is it black or do you, can you see the, the screen? Yeah, I can see the screen. You can see, okay. Yeah, so then to put the ultrasound jelly on your wrist. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create a boundary over here. Should I put the probe? Yeah, if you if you feel ready, yeah, go ahead. Nothing is happening. Should I start anything? Yeah, you can start scanning yourself. And if I'll be over in a second to get you started, I'm just gonna get this one set up so we can get three groups going.
I'm detecting my bus. <laughs> <laughs> so then this one is a 360 video. Mm -hmm. So whoever wants to come in can come here. Just come to where I am because if you step out of the boundary, it'll... it'll just in front of you? Yeah, just come to where I am. Okay, and then what we're going to do is... Again, you'll use your index finger on the trigger to control things. And what you're going to do is you're going to go into full screen. And then you'll see the difference between 2D and 3D. So this us you come right here. And you can keep your glasses on. I'll help you adjust this. That's a hazard. Just be careful. There's an open. Is that tight enough or too tight? That's good. OK. So then you should see a 360 video in front of you. I see. The anterior shoulder dislocation. Perfect. Okay, so hold out um, your which hand is? your left hand. Okay, I'm going to give you a controller. Okay, so at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll see an option oh, right now. The screen disappeared. Oh, did it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like I have the bar. Okay. Um, can I select something? What does is it like? It's the, just the bar. So that like the time and the apps. Okay, go to the purple icon that says browser. And then open that, and you should come back to MedCast 360. Yes. Okay. So then click on the anterior shoulder dislocation. Is there a scroll? Okay. It's here. Okay. And then go, go to full screen. You can play. And then go to full screen. And in the lower wow. right. Yeah. And then in the lower right hand corner, go to right now it's a non VR mode. Mm -hmm. Click on VR mode. On which corner? So the upper lower, lower right hand corner. There's Three dot, the three dots? Oh, non VR. Okay. Yeah, now go to VR and then go to 360 and then watch the difference. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, and then I will get these guys started. On. It's a little blurry in the. Okay, no, it's good. Okay. I'll come fix that in a sec. We're going to. Yeah, I, I got it. Okay, yeah. perfect. It was. Uh, All right. Um, for you to look at and then you can manipulate it. So we're just going to quickly do that and get an x-ray and then so we can go in two sessions. to step in here and then basically when you wear this uh, you'll be looking at a chest x-ray and then in your lower right hand corner you'll see uh, image manipulation and you can use those tools um, to play around with the image. So you're seeing what a radiologist would see. Okay, so come sit here and let's see where I am. Okay, and then face that way. Okay, and we're going to slip this over your head. Okay, 
and I'll just get you to put it over your head so it's comfy. Okay, you can wear your glasses while you do that. Okay, is that comfortable with where your bun is? Um, yes. Okay, do you want me to tighten this a bit? Um, okay, do you want to tighten up here? Or it's good. Okay, perfect. All right, so are you right or left hand? Um, all right, so stick out your right hand. I'm going to give you a controller. You're going to use your index finger. That one? Yeah. And you can, right now, you should be seeing a chest x ray. Yeah. So you'll be seeing um, the front view and the side view. We call that the AP and the lateral. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll see um, to your lower right, under the lateral view, you'll say image markup and the image manipulation. Yeah. So click on that. And I may have already clicked on it. And then in the lower middle, you'll be able to click on those tools and adjust the contrast. Mark up measure, make measurements, put arrows if you want. Oh, did it? Yeah. Is the other one there? Yeah, the side here. Wait, oh no, wait, the chest too. Never mind. It's there. Okay, perfect. Okay. So have fun playing around with that. And then I'm going to come help Sri Devi with the ultrasound. Yeah. How's it going? Did you find? I couldn't find. <laughs> I, so I, I made sure I could find mine earlier today. Yeah. So we, you can try my wrist. Okay. And then I'm just going to quickly set up the, see if I can set up the casting. I got mm -hmm. it to work earlier today. My little network. And, okay, maybe not. I'll try casting again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it may or may not work. It's really nice if you guys can kind of see what <laughs> the one person is seeing. Mm -hmm. But go ahead and scan my wrist and see. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, and I'm just going to flip your probe around for you. Okay, and then I don't see anything. Do you see? Maybe it's not picking up the. Is it? Is your um? Is the button to the left of the screen? Is it blue or is it orange? Blue. Okay, and so are you seeing like the image move if I move mm -hmm. around? Mm -hmm. no. Like it's frozen? Yeah, it's frozen. Yeah. Okay. I, don't, I can't see that. Usually the bezel, you, you'll see the pulse, right? But, but pulse like right. if I move the probe around, is, are the tissues moving around as well? No. no. Oh, it's the totally frozen. Is frozen. Okay, so then, can you, are you right or left handed? Right handed. Okay, so take this, and then can you click on the blue, the big circle, the blue button. Click on that. Did it turn orange now? This here, something is orange, like the frozen. Yeah, so cl click on the orange button. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it should turn blue. Mm -hmm. it's not that blue. Click on it again. Mm -hmm. You want to see this? Sure, I can try. Because what happens when you move from person to person mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah, it is, you're right, the image is frozen. So we're going to change it quickly. Okay, so now it's blue. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I'm just going to quickly change the depth to one centimeter. Okay, and then I'm just going to prove that I can see my beautiful radial artery. Okay, perfect. So I want to give this back to you. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay. Is, is the circle all blue? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to show you. You'll see a nice little pulsey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, perfect. Do you want to try to find my artery? <laughs> sure. And you can just press play on the video. So I'm going to get you to move more laterally onto my wrist. Oh, man, more sorry, more medially. Okay. <laughs> more medially. Yeah, move medially towards the. Uh, no. Uh, and then more you to the, set it to yeah, I'm just going to reposition your hands if that's okay. Yeah. I want to find it right here. Okay, you got the probe. Did you see where it has to mm. be? It's good? Okay. Yep, thank you. No worries. Okay, and then come more medially. Come more towards other medial. Your thumb? Come, your, come, come your toward, go towards the ulnar side. Ulnar side. Move towards the middle of my wrist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then right about there, you should find my hole. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should I try on my hand? Sure. Go for <laughs> it. <laughs> it's 
some more. Yeah, go for it. And then we have this here to wipe off all the goo. Okay. How's it going over there, Elian? <laughs> really, yeah. Did you expect yeah? like this Cool. Um, once you're done with that, I want to send Miriam over to you because I'm going to get you all to go through the radiology reading room first and then I'll set up the airway module. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and of course uh, simulation is always important because you can't use patients for <laughs> So Mary, sorry to interrupt. I'll get you to try the radiology reading room sure. because I'll cycle you all through the reading room and then I'll load up the area. Okay. So, um, Elian, are you? Perfect. Okay, so come on over. Don't move, Elian, because <laughs> otherwise we'll have to restart, uh, reset up the boundary. I will take that from you and you can go to the next station. So hop in there. You're right or left-handed? Perfect. Is that snug enough? Do you want me to help you adjust that? Okay, perfect. Stick out your right hand. Okay, and then put it backwards. Okay, are you in a radiology reading room? Okay, do you see a chest x ray in front of you? But I, there's a small image here I can select that. Maybe. Oh, yes. Um, can you look to your right a little bit? Is it more on the other screen? It's blank. Okay. Space. <laughs> okay. So then, just use your um, middle finger on the lower big button and take that this image, this bigger, uh, the lower one, yeah, and then drag it to the next. Yeah. I have this. It's going to be this. Or actually, no. Oh, there's like three. I see three boxes. Perfect. Three big things. Two are blank, and this one has the diagnosis. <laughs> there's two small images on the side. Okay. This three. Use your index finger to put it on the It's the worst day to put it on my head. The one that says chest x-ray. Yeah, that is the, I think it's the mic. Yeah, the mic. The mic can just take my butt out. Here, let me just get with her. I think that'll be easier, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Okay, and then you can just put it on the next one. So now you have two big chest x rays. You can see. And then I'm going to load. Okay. Yeah. So you can see you, when you set the other, you have two big, big, big chest x rays. Yeah, you can. You might need to see the steps forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 It's blue? No. Oh, did, did you see any blue dot? That should be a blue dot. Like a blue then circle? I uh, yeah. I see like. The screen and and, and and the blue circle like the flowers are frozen in you snowflake or something. Yes. Is oh, there? You see chest no. No. Oh, no. I just press this button. No. 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 This one. There is a blue <laughs> line <laughs> below. Okay, so the touch bar. Okay, like so then touch you the bottom the middle screen, you'll see okay. a markup tool. So then black and white. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just see the yellow like It's a yellow. Yeah, you should play around with those tools. I think you should do the finger and play around with the X-ray and the shields and adjust the contrast. This is the mission for radio. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now it's blue. Yeah. Okay, then... Hey, how's it going over here? Wait for your... Search for your pulse. <laughs> or if, if you can, you can use mine because I was able to find mine today. Yeah. Again? Can you feel it? I find it difficult to find my pulse today. Do you want me to find yours? Yeah. Okay. You got a beautiful pulse right here. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So we're just gonna put jelly right here over these two fingers. Perfect. Okay. And then you'll take the probe and you will scan. When you scan, you just see like something just like pulsing up on the gel. Yeah. Just put it yeah. on the gel. Yeah. And then you'll see like a little you circle see the that's pulsating, like a little. Someone is tapping something. You'll find something like that. Yeah. When you see the pulse. It's a shame that the Wi-Fi isn't working. I was able to do this at home today um, to cast because then you guys could see what I was seeing. Or I could see what you're seeing. Troubleshoot. Yeah. If something like something someone is uh, just poking you, it should be like that in that film. In the black and white clip, something like something like that should be there. Can you identify it? <laughs> it's difficult sometimes. 
And, uh, oh, it's as there's an error in the stream is not. Yeah, and the stream is like it. Okay. If you just move around here. You, can you see the movements? Yeah, I see the movements, but like nothing is like possible. Yeah. yeah. We have to show you what is the pulsing thing, then you can get it. <laughs> Do you see it? No, she no. can't. So I don't know, like, is something supposed to be like pulsing, like in the Yeah, lab? let me let me try it on my. <laughs> we definitely found my pulse. Um, I will tell you. Do you see like a little circle throbbing? Do you is, is the circle is the circle is it orange or is it blue? There's a circle. Uh, yeah, just to the, the left hand part. You you switch it off. Switch it down, like from yellow to blue. To yeah, I switch it to, to the blue. Okay, okay so, so if I move the probe, is your image moving? Yeah. Okay, perfect. In that image, something should be like someone is tapping. Difficult to identify. I couldn't identify it first time. Okay. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I've lost my pulse here. Let me just quickly step into <laughs> where you are. I'll come load them up yeah, for you in a sec can, here. You can play around with this though. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is going to change the depth to one. Is that going to work? Is it good? Yeah. Can you see that? Adjust the side onto it. I was just holding it up because it was a bit loose. Mm, yeah. 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 And a teeny tiny head. So mm -hmm. this is the. Yeah. Just a little lower. There you go. And then we can um, select mm -hmm. some features and stuff. Right. Okay, right there. Mm -hmm. So we can try getting the image back there and figure it out. Okay, and then there's that spot. Okay. I'm going to get you to step Brian. Flip this on. And yeah, I have a very bit yeah. small head, so I'm the opposite. Very large head. So in those discussions, did you think it would be more a head to do? Or? I know. Well, the. the the frustrations uh, of the counterclockwise to open. flying car has oh, yeah. come as quickly as you want. But other things have And then Jakob will get you over to the radial. Oh, because yeah, I know sure. my brother yeah. was doing so yeah. 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 Or to the side. My own friend had 10 years, they've been talking about it. it. So, like, right. Yes. But yeah. like, uh, so I'll give you uh, to cut your right hand. Solving the game of go. Use your index finger to switch to the blue. 25 years. Okay, now click on the Something depth, uh, and, then, okay, and then just go to one centimeter. So you're just kind of scrolling yeah. up and down. Yeah. So if you scroll down, it should go deeper. It'll say four centimeters. Scroll all the way up to one centimeter. I don't find any information. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come help you in a sec. Is this? Oh, one centimeter. Perfect. Okay. I'm sorry. So now. I cleared the image. I didn't know how to bring it back. <laughs> so Do you see like the diagnosis? Or is do you see like a page that you make in the Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you see that pulse? Yeah. Cool. So now yeah, you know what you're looking for. Do you space. want to try looking for my pulse? Yes. Yeah. And there's no windows in front of you? Yeah, there's windows. But they're black. <laughs> um, are you seeing two little small boxes, like two miniaturized x-rays? No. No? On the first, on the first window. To your and left. There's like two black ones, right? And then is there a first window where there's like two small images? No, I don't see any, like, I just saw a clear picture of this space, but nothing else. Okay, I'm going to come load that up for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I saw it for a couple seconds. Perfect. So you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Now. Okay, so your new challenge is to try to find your own pulse, okay. and then I'm going to get you to switch over to Jakob. And then, who has not done 360 video yet? Okay, so let me load this for you first, too, okay? <laughs> the problem is when you move around, it um, thinks you've stepped outside your boundaries, so things mm -hmm. are not safe. Okay, so we we'll set, we'll set where you are. Oh yeah, it's all black. Interesting. <laughs> okay, medical education. Continue. Chest X-ray. Not that one. This library. Back. Really 
done this one yet? No. Okay, perfect. So I'll get you to slip on. Here, I'm going to just set it up for you. Okay. And then, Jakob, have you done, who hasn't done 360? Well, I did the... Oh, sorry, we both haven't done the... I still have to do the oh, the radiology. Radio, okay. Yeah. Have you done radiology? I did radiology. Okay, so Jakob, I'll get you to do the radiology mm -hmm. suite next so I can load up the AR, VR, or the virtual reality module. Um, okay, so this one will go here. We'll adjust the depth. We'll find our artery. So basically what we're going to do is you're on yourself, you're going to find your pulse. Okay, and then once you've done that, you have kind of know what, where you're going to put your probe. Get you to step here and then slip it on. Okay. Can I just loosen it a bit? Yeah, totally. So counterclockwise to loosen it. And then yeah, just snug it up as you see fit. Now the image in front of you, is the circle blue or is it orange? Oof. Do you see an image in like a circle in front of you? I just switched up the image again. Do you see a screen? I see the screen. Right? <laughs> and is the... I was going to do something. Yeah, and is it what color is it? Okay, perfect. And if I move the probe, your image moves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it's okay. To the so you should see yeah, somewhere here, here like a little black case. pulsing yeah. thing. And then just like just on the screen. screen. And you can that will be my radial image. artery. Okay. You can do you see it? I think so. Did you say it was pulsing? Yeah. It's like throbbing. It's this little black circle. Got it? You can do it next week. It's not throbbing. <laughs> I mean, what I noticed is my artery is getting a little sluggish. Okay. <laughs> so now it's kind of getting lazy. But it okay, I think I, I think I know okay. what I'm, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, so I'm going to let you play around with the okay. probe and try so, to find. So, so how is it um, oriented? And so this is, is there a camera attached to this? Because uh, like, like being able to see the room. So you're in pass-through. So this is a mixed reality headset. So it's designed to let you see your full environment. Okay. Uh, and then the mixed reality part comes in. What you're seeing for a screen overlay is on a traditional handheld or emergency department bedside ultrasound. That's the same overlay, the mm -hmm. same tools you'd see. Outside the overlay, is that because is it yeah, recording right now or it's not recording? No, it's just it's just it's just like wearing glasses or like wearing sunglasses. Okay. Or, yeah, so it's not a camera. Because it looks like it's a video. It doesn't look. No, nope, um, this is real time. All real time. Yeah. Yeah, so go ahead and put that probe. So I'm going to get you to put it a bit more perpendicularly. Yeah, perfect. Just a bit more contact. I'm just going to adjust it. Right here. Okay, let me come fix that for you in a sec here. I'm also seeing. Should I be kicking? Is it, it's not working? Um, I think 
it's from Pulse, so oh, okay. I okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll get you to find your own pulse while <laughs> I. <laughs> The, the challenge of the boundary because if I set up a room scale boundary technically you're free to walk around but then you might walk into other things okay let me fix this quickly So you can see the lung markings, the heart, you can see the bones, the ribs, um, you can see the soft tissues, and basically you're just trying to read and see if you find anything abnormal. Just I have a question. Yes. So right now, um, using these for as training, the simulations are going to usually on cadavers? Yeah, yeah, so when we do anatomy lab, uh, right now the gold standard is doing the dissection on a cadaver. 
Yeah. 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 on the VR set. So the, the simulation, it's a cadaver simulation? Or like when you do the patient simulation, you don't want to... Oh, no, it'll be a simulated like? patient. Okay. Yeah, so it'll just be a VR patient. So, for example, um, when you were, we were looking at the moon demo, mm -hmm. that patient you saw yes. was a simulated patient. But you end up getting so into it. So, for example, when I was testing the, the scenario, and I was using the stethoscope, like, I took a step back and was like, oh my gosh, I'm treating this as if like it's a real mm -hmm. patient. Because you get so into the breath sounds, the heart sounds, um, you really end up getting into the simulation. So. Uh, I don't think, unfortunately, because it's almost time already, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be, I'll be able to load up the VR. Uh, so I was just, yeah. just wondering, so in those patient simulations, um, if you were to make a mistake, are you able to replicate how that mistake would look like in real life? Or, um, yeah, I mean, yes. Like the effect it has on the patient. Um, yeah, to a certain extent. So for example, with the airway module, it's meant for accrediting paramedics. Mm -hmm. So the way it works is it's not just training, but it's there's a testing as well. So there's a view for the administrator to view the entire recording as well as submitted test questions like multiple choice, audio recordings, video recordings. So then I as the administrator, you're the paramedic who's gone through it. I'm reviewing the scenario mm -hmm. and I can see, oh, she made a critical error. She was trying to insert an IV like this instead of this, right? Mm -hmm. So you can kind of re replicate it. Um, I don't know if our patients end up dying. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering what would be the barriers in creating that. So it's yeah, more certainly... extreme, like in more extreme procedures or experimental procedures. If I wanted to see, I, I don't, I don't have a medical background, but so I don't know if this is a thing. But like, if I wanted to see if this procedure would work or this new technique or whatever, yeah. would I be able to see the aftermath, or or yeah. just would it just be helpful for practicing the technique? That's a good question. So if you were doing like experimental surgery, I didn't include it in my slides because it's way too gory. But there was an Italian neurosurgeon about ten years ago who mm -hmm. wanted to do the world's first head transplant, right? And so. If you wanted to replicate that in VR, you could replicate the anatomy. You can't because we don't know what would happen. So that would be computer so. modeling. So then you'd have to look at what is our best understanding of projections of what would happen if you were to try to reattach a spinal cord or a brain stem, which is impossible. This guy convinced everyone it was, but it's not. Um, so yeah, that's that's where you're going back to your earlier question of bringing in other technologies. You'd have to bring in computer modeling. So, for example, as simulations get higher and higher fidelity, the reason why we can't um, totally replace doctors at this point is because there's individual variation and judgment calls mm -hmm. into patient context that needs to be made, right? So even as a surgeon, there might be an aorta, they might be a skinny little aorta, they might be a fat aorta. When we're doing a gallbladder removal, maybe we expect an artery to run like this, but maybe it runs like this because that's a known anatomical variant. So as we run more anatomy labs, or as we run more simulations, we can start building in different patient variations for airway modules. The standard area that we have to intubate in our airway modules is a young, healthy guy with an easily mobile neck. It's very easy to intubate. When we talk about why it's challenging to intubate a patient, maybe they have a collar on, they can't move their neck. Maybe they're a big guy, like a football player with a short neck, making it super hard. To visualize. Maybe they're a child, maybe they're an old lady. Um, so that's the next step of simulation is recreating the diversity of patient populations that we see in the real world. So in your training, only being able to practice on um, patients, you get to see that individuality every time you practice. Do you think there's a risk here for training, you know, you train your muscle memory to the VR simulation, and I've always trained on this only model. That affect my ability to recognize that, you know, or, or adapt to new situations? Kind of, sort of. So there's there's a couple things you need to know when a procedure, before you do any procedure, you need to know the steps, you need to know the purpose, and then in order to get a patient to consent to the um, procedure, you need to tell them the risks, mm -hmm. benefits, side effects, and alternatives. That's true of anything, that's true of a flu yeah. shot. So if I'm giving a flu shot, I need to let you know the small risk mm -hmm. of a infection, sore arm, um, uh, cervical site reaction. Um, so then, as you're, and then if you're coming back to the question about like variability in the yeah in the whatever so that it comes with practice and because even as many say, it's so interesting that yeah. as much as you learn in residency you learn so much more yeah. in your first five years of no, practice because now you're the boss you're the one making mm -hmm. those decisions so um, 
I think that's why they call medicine practice. <laughs> because like you're still learning the whole Yeah, like, but that's yeah. what I mean. So if you're always you practicing on these simulations, will that affect your ability to adapt? No, no so the, the, the idea is it. It's, it's always a balance, right? But, uh, but you're, I think ultimately it's helpful because you're not saying that you're only practicing yeah, in VR for two weeks. Yeah. It's practicing in VR until you have the confidence yeah. and the knowledge, and then you can go into the real world. Um, so then you're going to you're not going to be doing appendectomies yeah. in VR for two weeks. Someday you're going to go into the wild. Um, yes, of course. No, I'm glad you're. Um, so so in. What, what would we need in order to do simulations where we can kind of predict what would happen? So in the experimental ones. So if we wanted to kind of predict, like I want to see, I want to try this out and see, like I don't know what's going to happen, I want to see what could, yeah. what could happen. Yeah. What, what do you feel like are steps we would need to get to that point? I know that's like probably that's a really great far question. but what are the barriers towards achieving that? Yeah, so it's, um, it's three ancillary technologies. So it's the immersive technology. It's computing power to recreate the fidelity of the simulation. So the coolest thought experiment, when I think about the difference between immersive and the physical world, there's people out there who are like, we're living in a simulation, right? So if you go through that thought experiment and say, we're living in a simulation right now, mm -hmm. focus on the depth of um, resolution that we need to be able to make sure we, we feel this. This has a texture. That's, if that's a simulation, how much computing power goes into that? The shadows and how they change. The, the temperature of this versus this. Like, if this truly is a simulation, the amount of commuting mm -hmm. power to go into that is insane. So then you translate that to building the next generation of high fidelity virtual reality, then we need more computing power. So that's one. Then the other ones we've talked about are computer modeling, um, saying, okay, well, we know that when we do this to a high risk surgery, these are the likely outcomes and this is how probable they are. So building out the computer models and then adding in machine learning to say, well, if you do this, this is the more likely outcome. Mm -hmm. So events where the convergence of all these technologies. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very good question. Um, so so it's kind of, that would be a really useful use for it instead totally. of like experimenting on people. Totally. Can, yeah. Totally. And so even taking a practical point, taking a step away from mixed reality, when we look at the world of animal testing, mm -hmm. the idea of animal testing is to slowly use fewer animals, do so in a way that's ethical, do so in a way that enables repeat usage and also can eventually be replaced by computer models as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your good questions. <laughs> really interesting questions. Any questions? Um, yeah, I do. Um, I'm not sure if you saw like, the existing research platforms for VR applications, so you can move around. And also, I was thinking about the growth that you can put on your fingers to, yes. to yeah. grab things and have the perception of grabbing them. So, I was like, curious to see like, what's your opinion on that. If you can improve the, the VR applications? Yes, yeah, 100%. So I think my learning point from this workshop is it's so you also how finicky it was because when we create to keep ourselves safe as users of virtual reality, we create a boundary. We can create the stationary boundary, which is what all of these headsets have. Mm -hmm. But that means if we step a little bit too much to the side, we lose the image enough to come and reboot. Some games require us to run all across the room. We create a room scale boundary. So then the way we do that is we use our controller to draw a boundary and then we can make a bigger boundary. And then when we run beyond that, then it says brings us back. So you, there's definitely room scale application, which I'll probably use for the next iteration of this workshop. Haptic gloves as well are a great way. We've actually um, partnered with, uh, do you remember that anesthesia simulation mm -hmm. case study? So that was a group in Germany and we partnered with them because they had uh, haptic gloves. So then, then that's the next level of simulation, right? Because if you're, um, you know, replicating, best case scenario, you're replicating the feel of the tissues, the the skin, the artery once you get in there, the bone if you go too far, right? And then you can feel that haptic feedback, and maybe you get a jolt when you kind of go too far. Um, then that's the next level. So haptic gloves are are out there. They're in the experimental phase, but that's another way of increasing the fidelity of your simulation. So, yeah. There you go. Um, happy to take more questions. Uh, I know you guys are officially dismissed five minutes ago, <laughs> uh, but you guys have an email address. So thank you very much. Thank and um, you. Yeah, I look forward to your Thank you so much.